property people and welcome to look sometimes i take you to really scenic locations other times you end up in a garden outside my hotel i'm in tokyo japan uh, and i just needed to do an office hours before my trip ended so that i could get everything uploaded and ready to go I'm heading back to the united states today after the end of a month-long trip through Beijing, Zhengzhou, China, Osaka, Kyoto, and now finally Tokyo. Normally I try to take you to fun places when we go do these office hours, but I was kind of greedy and all my time in Tokyo I used doing things that I like to do. Oh, finally, and, and one of my favorite things to do in Tokyo is uh, conveyor belt sushi restaurants. Uh, I don't, I guess I do know why. I was going to say I don't know why those disappeared in the United States before I got a chance to try them in the U.S., but of course it was COVID. Now these days we don't want people breathing on all, you know, food going around in a circle, I suppose. Uh, but it's awesome. I love conveyor belt sushi. It's amazing. It's just neat. You're just, you're sitting on a bar watching these plates of sushi go by. You just grab whatever sushi you want. Uh, they either color code the plates, so different colors are different prices, or in my favorite one here in Tokyo, it's 150 yen, which is like a buck per plate of sushi, and it's all the same color, and it's just they put different amounts of sushi on the plate, like really expensive fish, they put less on there, cheaper fish or vegetarian options, they put a whole bunch of stuff on the plate. Um, and you just sit there racking up plates because the stuff is so doggone good. Oh, I got I got absolutely go do that today for lunch before I go hop on a plane going back to the United States. Um, so let's go through your uh, questions, your top voted questions from Polgab. Um, the top voted question is from Rumi. Just a second here. I got to connect my phone again. Polgab. And then from Rumi. Rumi asks, how does the best Postgres management app compare to SSMS 22? I couldn't tell you. I have not done detailed comparisons of all the different Postgres apps out there. Um, that's one of the things that kind of separates Postgres from SQL Server. With SQL Server, everything's built in the box. There's a built-in way to do clustering, a built-in way to do log shipping, a built-in way to do spatial data, a built-in management tool. And I guess it's not in the same installer anymore, but really it's built in. Um, whereas Postgres, you have a whole buffet of stuff, but then you're kind of hit by analysis paralysis because there's no application store for Postgres. So when you want to find a database management tool, you tool, <laughs> stool, you have to a crutch. You have to start Googling around trying to find comparisons between them, and, and it's a, really a giant pain in the rear. So I love SQL Server Management Studio. It's phenomenal, especially the work uh, that the team has been doing in the last couple of releases. It's fantastic. Uh, next up, Mango asks, Hi Brent, we're running an on-premises SQL Server 2019 plus Azure SQL. I'm trying to get my boss to purchase a monitoring tool, but he insists that I use Azure Database Watcher. Database Watcher can't monitor on-premises databases. So what are your thoughts regarding a monitoring tool versus Database Watcher? Um, if you search for Brent Ozar Database Watcher, I've got a short post out there about it. Database Watcher just watches doesn't do any alerting. It doesn't email you when things are bad. If you're okay with that, I suppose Database Watcher is fine. But I want something that does more than just watch. When I'm looking for a partner, I don't want someone to just watch. If you get my drift. Next up, Feeling Turquoise says, How worried should I be if SP Blitz First takes 20 seconds to run? Don't worry about that. Read the output. Read the output to start understand what's going on on the server and take actions from there. I find it really helpful when I'm running queries. The most valuable thing isn't the timer. It's the result of the query the more you know. Uh, next up, Chicago Dave says, how disruptive do you foresee the imminent AI bubble burst being? 
Um, that's a question. It's like, how do you still beat your wife? There's not really a, a right way to answer that. Either way is kind of weird because you're making an assumption based in there that there is an AI bubble and that it's imminent that it's going to burst. I don't believe that that's the case. There's a great saying in the stock market. The market can remain illogical uh, longer than you can remain solvent. And illogical isn't the right word. I can't remember what the right word is, but basically it means that the, the market can do dumb things a lot longer than you can be smart about investing in it. Um, for an example, I would give you Tesla stock. There were a lot of people who were shorting Tesla stock for a really long time because the numbers didn't make any financial sense. Um, but Tesla stock is still unbelievably high. It's still massively high. I don't have any investment in it. I don't have any position on that kind of thing. Um, but it's still massively high. And the people who shorted the stock, most of them lost their shirt along the way. At some point, bubbles often burst. But what a lot of those investors are gambling on is that they're going to pick the right horse that's going to make it to the finish line before the rest of the companies collapse. So I wouldn't put any thought or energy into trying to predict what's going to be the winning horse, uh, where the safe investments are. All I can do is just continue to use the tools uh, that are available to me in the market uh, and try to do the best job that I can while those tools are available to me. It's kind of like so you're too young to remember this, but there was this dot-com bubble back in like the late 90s, early 2000s. There was this dot-com bubble and companies would do ridiculously dumb things trying to gain market share because their idea was if they could just gain enough market share, they'd beat everybody else out, kind of like the way that Uber did successfully. Um, and so there were companies like pets.com that would ship you 25 pound bags of dog food for like five dollars you get like five dollars you would buy the dog food and it would get shipped to you you cannot make money doing that business so as a result i just as a consumer i did what was available to me at the time i got plenty of dog food there were fashion brands that would give you 25 dollar gift certificates and then sell their t-shirts for like 20 dollars. so you could just keep getting free gift certificates and free t-shirts you know from fashion brands uh and that company had no way of ever making money so i had all kinds of t-shirts from them what I would say is all AI companies are losing money right now. Why would you not use their computing for free when they're willing to light money on fire and give it to you? They are giving you free stuff at a loss. Uh, so why would you not use those tools? My memberships to stuff like ChatGPT and Anthropic Cla Claude and Google Gemini, I gladly pay like 20 bucks a month for unlimited usage on those. They are losing their shirt on me. I hammer their computing stuff. But as long as they're willing to lose their money, I'd be an idiot not to take their money and uh, use it to do a better job at my job. Now let's see here, what's the next question in the list? I suppose I should also say, so, you, so your, your question assumes that the, that the market is going to disrupt imminently or the burst is going to, the bubble is going to burst imminently. If it did burst imminently, I don't think it would really have any effect on me whatsoever. I'd just stop getting access to all these cool AI tools at a ridiculously cheap rate and I'd have to go back to doing work the hard way, which is kind of okay because I did that for decades anyway. Uh, next up, Roddick asks, Hi Brent, I believe I heard you saying that it's a good idea to work with the most expensive thing in the room so that your salary looks small by comparison. He says, I wonder why you decided to work with SQL Server and not Oracle. Well, you're, the answer's in your question. Oracle wasn't in the room at the companies I worked for. So there you go. Uh, next up, my tea got cold says, do you see any value in enabling accelerated database recovery for the sole purpose of making it easier to recover from accidental long running transactions? If you have to face that problem on a regular basis at your company, then yes. But of course, I would question and say, why are you dealing with accidental long-running transactions that frequently? Go solve that problem because it's going to cause other issues like blocking that accelerated database recovery doesn't solve you or, uh, save you from. So go solve the root cause problem. Um, so I'm not a fan of turning that switch on because it also causes user databases to grow rather than TempDB. 
because the versions are now stored in the user database, causes the user databases to grow, causes your backups to grow, causes your disaster recovery replicas to grow, causes more stuff to be sent over availability group streams. You see where I'm going with that. The, the, the cure would be worse than the disease. Am I saying it's a bad feature? No, it's fine, but just turn it on for the right reasons. Don't turn it on just because you have some transactions that might run long sooner or later. Viewmaster, I remember those, asks, in SQL views, what is your take on naming conventions? Do you use one? I So because of my weirdo job, I get involved with stuff after it's already built. Clients rarely, every now and then they, they bring me in, but rarely bring me in before the problem strikes. Uh, they usually bring me in afterwards, so I don't get to choose things like naming conventions. If I was going to build my own stuff, I wouldn't prefix views with VW underscore, because I just don't think that that really makes sense. But I also don't really passionately care about it one way or another. I, I'm a huge believer in stoicism, where you want to focus on things that matter and things that you have control over. I couldn't care less about things like naming conventions or code formatting, whatever. It doesn't stop me from getting my job done. Next up, Dopinder asks, what was your experience like with the Great Firewall of China? And do VPNs work with it? So this is such a great question. The Great Firewall of China it really is a thing. It really is like there are two separate internets. There's the internet in China and there's the American and rest of world internet. And a lot of the sites that you rely on outside of China do not exist in China. Like I couldn't access uh, Google, couldn't access my Gmail, couldn't access Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, GitHub all the sites that you think of that you would commonly work with. Like you're probably used to, if you're like me, if I'm looking for something, I just type it in in the search bar and I find it. We don't get that if your search is hooked up to Google. It's going to need to be hooked up to something else, like a Chinese search engine. Um, so some VPNs work, some VPNs do not. It's a constant game of whack-a-mole with the Chinese government versus uh, trying to protect the, the, their own internal internet. Um, your best bet is to have an American phone or whatever, European phone, whatever, with a sim, uh, that SIM card or that uh, plan, uh, and then do all your surfing from that and you'll still need a VPN and you need to get it before you come over to China. But most stuff should be unblocked if you have a foreign phone with a foreign SIM and a foreign phone number. And you just have to pay whatever the data roaming charge is for your cell phone. I use T-Mobile so I can add on like 15 gigs worth of data for it's like 50 bucks or something. It's not too bad. Um, next up, Dopinder asks, our company has no data retention, so our database is massive. I think you had a typo there. I think you meant to say you have no data uh, retention rules, so you don't purge any data. It says, what are the pros and cons of not having any data retention rules? Um, really, this comes down to what your attorneys and uh, security people are comfortable with. Go talk to your company's legal team and say, hey, um, is there a rule about how much data we should keep and when we should purge data? Your company's attorneys will have passionate feelings about this and will say things like anything older than seven years needs to be deleted, anything over 10 years needs to be deleted, some kinds of data can never be deleted, but they're the ones who drive that. And the reason why they want to get rid of data as quickly as possible is they don't want any evidence inside your databases that could be used against them. I'll give you an example, human resources. You wouldn't want every time card punch from forever staying in your company's databases. Because what if it turns out they did something wrong with overtime? What if they weren't paying enough overtime to people? Your lawyers want to be able to say, well, sorry, you can't go back 50 years because our company policies are we only keep seven years worth of data. They want to limit that blast radius to make sure the damage isn't too bad. So go check with your attorneys on that and that'll guide for you. Jan asks, hi, Brent, you've recommended Itzik Ben-Gan's book several times. It's because they're really good. Do you know of any good material like books targeting entity framework on SQL Server? Yes, Julie Lerman, L-E-R-M-A-N, 
I don't think there's an H in there. I think it's just Julie, L-E-R-M-A-N. If you search for that in Entity Framework, she's got training classes, conference videos, books, you name it. She's uh, one of the big authorities out there on making Entity Framework perform well, not just with databases, but just in general. Really good stuff. I've seen her, I've had the luxury of seeing her present at developer conferences, and I've always just been really impressed with her work. Um, DTEC says, hi Brent, my friend is going to work at a new client where a client is going to ask him which version to use, which version can he recommend. Search for Brent Ozar, which SQL Server version, and I've got a whole blog post out there with the pros and cons of different versions, and I keep it updated. I updated it after the release of SQL Server 2025, so you can go out there, go through the pros and cons for your own company's needs, and get the right answer for you. Uh, one more, let's see, Elwood asks, what are your thoughts on running an eight core server for reporting on Azure local infrastructure? I have no idea what Azure local infrastructure is. No clue. I would assume by the name that it's probably some kind of deal where you can put Azure in your own data center. The hell would you want to do that for? for SQL Server. Why would you want to run it on something that has more overhead? Just run SQL Server, right? Keep your, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Instead of, you probably just saw a video or learned about this new hammer and you're like, oh, this sounds cool. What can I hit with this hammer? Put the hammer down. Look at what problems you're trying to solve instead of trying to beat your SQL Server to death with additional overhead. Uh, he says there could be some cost savings with Azure Local Deployment. We'll find out. I have never seen a platform that I would install that would cut my costs as opposed to just installing what I need. Usually they want to make money off of whatever that other tool is, right? They want to charge you for that. Now, virtualization is separate, but there are plenty of open source virtualization tools that you can use for free. You don't have to throw some Azure thing on there to do it. Yeah, so we'll stop there. Um, and then let's see, we'll do one more. JRL says, the coding models and tools have made rapid progress in recent months. Please talk about your approach to LLM-assisted coding. Can you quantify the productivity gain you're seeing with uh, LLM-assisted coding? No, I'm not going to do that. Let me tell you why. Because I think, I think you're going to want to hear why I won't talk about stuff like that. The state of the art changes so quickly. Like it changes from month to month. And so I don't want to put something out there in January of whatever today. I don't have a date on this one. I think today's like the... 10th or 11th of January as I'm recording this. It's probably not going to go live for another week, maybe. Then it's going to hit my blog a week after that. Then you're going to be, because you're not particularly sober or quick, you're going to be watching it like a month late. And by the time that you watch it, the things that I said on the video may no longer be true. The industry is moving that fast. The models change so quickly. Um, so I don't want to give you any current state type stuff when the state of the art is changing so fast. I am also, because the state of the art is changing so quickly, I am not the kind of person who has enough time on my hands to do constant comparison between different tools. I am using AI not to teach you how to use AI, I'm using it just to use it myself. For the things that I need to do on a daily basis, I use it for that. So I don't have enough time to quantify like what different approaches may be, like does cursor still the state of the art? Should you use VS Code? Should you, what plugin should you use and so forth? I don't have the time to, to do that kind of comparative analysis. I tend to just keep using the same tool over and over to get the job done. So hopefully that answers a few uh, questions for you. Hope you learned something, and I'll see you all in the next office hours. Adios, y'all. Bye.